Hi, everyone. Welcome to our session on how to drive consensus in open source communities. Um, by way of introduction, my name is Jill Lovato. I have been with the Linux Foundation for over nine years now, coming up on 10. Um, I'm a director of uh, outreach and communications. I work primarily within uh, some of the networking and edge communities. Um, and I will let Trishan introduce himself. Hi, my name is Trishan Elanrol. I'm uh, with uh, F5. I work for the Security Distributed Cloud Group, uh, leading sort of strategic initiatives and strategic planning, as well as sort of a open source SME within that organization. And uh, yeah, I've been with uh, F5 for over two years, but a uh, little background, I was with the Linux Foundation as a senior technical community architect uh, back on, under the Linux networking group for about over the last like seven years before that. That will kick off. So before we get started, we have a little clip that we want to show that I think pretty well illustrates um, some of the challenges that we can often face when we're in different groups all trying to uh, agree on something. Uh, albeit with a comedic spin to it. But, yep. Oh. Hmm. The problem appears to be unsolvable. Maybe we could run some computer simulations. There are too many variables that would take forever. We've got to be missing something. Let's start again. The movie is playing here at 7.20, here at 7.40, <laughs> here at 8.10, and here at 8.45. All right, these theaters have to be eliminated. Why? They're state-of-the-art, digital projection, 20-channel surround sound. Yes, but they have no icy machines. <laughs> Despite my aggressive letter writing campaign, I might add. Wait, what about the multiplex here? The seats are terrific. They have Twizzlers instead of Red Vines. No amount of lumbar support can compensate for that. Well, it's going to take at least an hour to eat, and I don't see a Sheldon-approved restaurant proximate to a Sheldon-approved theater. We could eat off to the movie. Unacceptable. The delay would result in tomorrow morning's bowel movement occurring at work. Hang on, hang on. There's a 7-Eleven here. We smuggle Slurpees, which are essentially ices, in under our coats after having a pleasant meal either here, here, or here. Wow. I don't see how we missed that. Excuse me, in what universe are Slurpees ices? <laughs> That's how we missed it. Sheldon, would you be prepared on a non-presidential basis to create an emergency ad hoc Slurpee icy equivalency? Oh, Leonard, you know I can't do that. <laughs> okay, I guess we only have one option. Yep, I don't see any way around it. Bye, Sheldon. See ya. Later, dude. <laughs> so I think you've, you probably can relate this to meetings that you've been in, community meetings perhaps, personalities that you've had to deal with, where you literally wanted to walk out of the room. And that's sort of the challenge here. Yep. Yes, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, so as we've kind of discussed already, um, what we're here to talk about today is how do we manage situations like that, maybe not with ICs, but with code, um, in our communities when you've got a whole bunch of different people coming from different places all over the world with different agendas. Well... We don't really have an answer. <laughs> There's not a one size fits all, but we're gonna talk about some of the tools um, that we've been using um, in, in our experience that uh, sort of help us get to where we're, we need to go, so. And we're gonna go with sort of in a, at a high level on this uh, kind of presentation because in each of the topics, you could actually drill down and have day long workshops as well as sessions on. So we're kind of keeping it at that high level. But yeah, it, the idea is how do we foster a healthy community environment for participation and encourage participation? And we kind of boiled it down to fostering transparency, inclusivity, and engagement. With that. Yep. Yeah, well, and, and the, the key here is soft skills. So soft skills are something some people are innately born with and just know how to do these things. Other, other people, are they're things that you have to learn. Maybe a little bit of both for most of us. Um, but those are, I think, the attributes that are going to be most effective in some of these situations. So we're going to talk a little bit about what some of those look like and some tools that you can use. So first off, you need to find the North Star. At the end of the day, every open source community is working towards some sort of objective. 
And of course, within those objectives, there are smaller objectives, but you have the one North Star. So what are, you, what are you trying to accomplish as a community and what does that look like? Once you're there, you can plan out different ways to get there. Um, and of course, you know, those ways are going to be different. There's often a million different ways to reach the same goal. And so it's important that you work through that and that you not lose focus on what you're trying to do versus how you get there. Yeah. And with that sort of the critical piece is communication, right? How do you foster engagement within your community for people to participate and discuss? And so you want to be clear in what you're doing. You have your uh, proposals or your uh, RFPs, or request for proposals, uh, your processes, your decision process should all be clearly laid out. So if you've seen some of the LF uh, projects, they have charges kind of defining the North Star for your project or the mission statement, and then you kind of guide, you have the rules of the road, so to speak, that you kind of define and, and have that. And then you want to, uh, put out the, clearly understand who's doing what, where. So you have your technical steering committee members. Uh, they're, they're kind of responsible for ensuring that North Star is there uh, and then the technical di direction of the project. And, and this is oftentimes where some conf confusion come in. So I think this is a really important step is figuring out who's responsible for what and what that responsibility looks like. I know there are people that are natural born leaders that kind of sometimes come up in these communities and tend to take over. And we'll talk a little bit about that more and, you know, some strategies of how to deal with that. Um, but it's, I think, as a good first step, kind of knowing where your lanes are. And it does get difficult in open source because we're a meritocracy, we're not, you know, there's not one person in charge. So that can blur the lines a little bit versus in a corporate environment where, you know, you've, you've got a very rigid reporting structure. Um, so this could be a little bit of a gray area, but knowing who's on which committee and uh, all that stuff is helpful. It's, uh, and I kind of, we put it out, the responsibility assignment matrix. So if you've probably seen in your corporate projects, you have races for your projects, which kind of define who's doing what, the swim lanes. Uh, so at a, you can have a lightweight version of that for your, within your communities. But uh, the races are a good model, at least to know who's responsible for a particular item or delivery, and then who's accountable for that in the, at the end as well. With that, yeah, I'm going to go take the... I you probably shouldn't put your back towards our yeah. audience. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I was trying to think. Um, yeah, so then with that, uh, one of the, the key sort of, as you said, sort of a soft skill here is practicing active listening. So one, you may come with a preconceived notion or a approach to something and you may think, you know, you're right or you're going to push and that. And you might be right, but. <laughs> but be open to listening to the others in the, in the group uh, within the meeting. Uh, allow, them, allow a voice at the table and then hear what they have to say as well. And then if folks feel that, you know, you're fostering that sort of engagement and asking, you know, what should we do? What are your thoughts? Um, how should we move forward with this? you're more likely to get additional engagement and potentially new ideas. Yeah, and opening up the floor to, to comments and discussion, even though not everyone's gonna feel comfortable speaking up, can go a long way versus somebody just coming in trying to dictate and tell everybody what needs to do, what needs to happen. Um, and then I think that leads us kind of back into to some other communication goals is updates and feedback loops. There's a lot of different ways this can look, but it's important that all of that stuff is documented and it's accessible. Um, you know, we all use things like uh, mailing lists, discussion forums, wikis, repositories, all of that, issues trackers. It, it's important that those things get updated, even though that work can sometimes be tedious. And also certain participants may not engage in, in certain forums. They may be more comfortable than others. We'll be touching that on touching on that in the next, I think, uh, next section. This leads us to inclusivity. So, you know, this, this isn't a talk about DEI, but we do need to touch on it a little bit because it's part of how we engage with our communities. Um, I think something that we deal with a lot working with global audiences is that we need to be really mindful of tone, especially over email. Um, I know some cultures can be viewed by other cultures, just the way that they talk can come across to somebody else as rude, and that's not your intention. We're not asking you to fix that, but just be mindful of your tone, especially in emails. Um, avoid euphemisms. This is one that um, I learned the hard way. <laughs> I think we were actually working together in a project on this. Um, in English, the term, um, what was it? Uh, Fire away or shoot, shoot it. Pull the trigger. 
it was, it, we were talking about doing some sort of activity. Oh, we're going to pull the trigger on that. And, you know, it just kind of came out. But if you, you know, somebody who doesn't, who is a, not a native English speaker, if you translate that directly, it could come, off, come across as a really violent term. So, you know, just things like that, even though they're normal figures of speeches in your native language, aren't always going to translate well. <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's the same thing. So euphemism that may be common in the U.S. may not be common in Europe. And vice versa. Vice versa. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then I, you know, this goes into, we talked a little bit about this, about the encourage contributions from everybody. You know, not everybody feels comfortable speaking up vocally in English. Not everybody feels comfortable typing their stuff out. So again, just make sure that you provide different forms and venues for seeking that feedback and communication um, just to speak to different people's needs. The other thing to be cognizant about is your time zones when you do community yeah. meetings, especially understanding that we're all a global community and there isn't, there isn't an ideal sweet spot in terms of time. Like if you're on the East Coast, 8 a.m. might be okay. It's a compromise, but try to be flexible. Have some of your meetings in APEC time zone one, one week or one month and then another one. So kind of all have dual meetings so that you can engage in community participation across the groups. Uh, and touching on the language perspective, we were working on a project, and I think it was that were, it was brought to our attention that oh, there are some community members that you know English is not their native language, but they are comfortable typing out their responses, but not engaging in a Zoom call, like on a live call. So to engage, encourage that. Maybe you know you have you have uh, follow-up meetings in email or chat so it's easier for people to respond to and, and typing responses out that gives them more time to articulate what they want to say. Um, you could also record the Zoom sessions so people can go back and review it so, and then digest it that way as well. Uh, yep. Uh. And then when people when people are coming into the community we want to make sure not just do something that you think is welcoming but it's important to set up clear onboarding processes and, and mentorships are often really useful as well. Yeah, make it easy for your for the first. Uh, we kind of call it out as a tip here. The, f the first issue, have a set of issues in your issue tracker for your project for new newcomers uh, to easily take in and, and do, and make it easy for them to find it rather than having them go through your list of issues that you have. Uh, so tag them, make it easy. Yeah, you don't want them to have to dig through documentation to find something. Yep. Also, have decent documentation. <laughs> Okay, now this kind of leads us to where sometimes it can get difficult. So at the end of the day, we are trying to seek consensus here. Um, conflicts are gonna arise. We'll talk a little bit about that more in the next slide. Um, but in order to get there, um, I think a lot of the stuff we've been talking about so far is we want respectful dialogues. Um, we want to make sure that we consider different people's values, different viewpoints. Um, and a, a part of that, and sometimes when people disagree, that it happens. That's what happens in collaboration. That's what happens in human discussions and interaction. Um, and there's different ways to kind of approach that when decision making is sometimes difficult. Um, you can break down larger decisions into smaller, more iterative processes. Did you want to give some examples of? If you're maybe you're, you're tackling a, uh, a bigger technical. A challenge. You're trying to develop a, a new a software solution instead of saying, okay, let's build out the whole architecture from the get-go. There's going to be clashing of opinions on how to approach that. So maybe you break it out and say, okay, let's work on the API design first. And then within that, how do we want to handle uh, XYZ? And so that'd be easier kind of bite-sized pieces and then you build the whole from that. But you still keep the North Star you know, where your end goal is the common goal. So we keep that in mind and then you kind of break those down. Yeah, and sometimes you're gonna have to leverage what we call either lazy consensus or rough consensus um, because not everyone's not always going to agree. So in the example that we saw from Sheldon. Um, <laughs> the rough consensus was Let's leave him and let's go. <laughs> yeah, he, he was unwilling to compromise. He was being very difficult. Um, and so at the end of the day, they're like, look, we want, we, our goal is to go see this movie and get something to eat and you're not, it's not working. So we're just gonna go. Maybe not the best approach 
<laughs> to follow, but I think it's relevant to what we do every day. Um, and then, of course, lazy consensus is when nobody really objects, but you want to make sure that you provide that space and that opportunity for people to, to voice any concerns if they do have them. And having that option keeps your project moving forward as well, because if you would always want to have consensus with the group and say everyone must agree, at some point your project is going to stall mm -hmm. because nobody agrees on something and there's no path forward. So instead, you have this sort of option where you're saying, okay, nobody's really disagreeing with this approach. Uh, it may not be the ideal, but let's move forward. We can iterate on it going in the next step. And so that's how you kind of take that tact. Uh, also, the other one that we, we want to call out would be, you do make a decision. You have the process of working it out, document it, write it up. You have community members who come and go, they'll they'll change to new people come in. You don't want to rehash the same or the same issue. This happens even in, in your own day-to-day -day corporate jobs probably as well. When new leadership comes in, you re-litigate an issue or a, a, a decision that was made. And then you have to go back and dig out the, oh, here's the, the proposal, original proposal, or here's the approvals. It's the same thing. If you're in your community, if you document it on your wiki, you, you can say on this date, this meeting, we, we discussed this, these were the rationale for what we decided, uh, this is why, and then a decision taken and move forward. That way if somebody joins and says, oh, why didn't you guys do X, Y, Z instead of doing A, B, C? Well, here's our rationale for it, and this is why we moved with that direction. Yeah. All right. So when conflicts arise, because they will. <laughs> Um, and we just want to say that, you know, like we said, there is no, there's no one size fits all. There's not an easy solution for dealing with all of this. Um, these are just some things that sometimes work for us. Um, again, that North star, we, we keep bringing it up, but that's really important to focus on. Um, think about the final outcome, try to find common ground. Obviously that can be really difficult sometimes. Um, but I think if, if it comes down to it, um, you can host a mediated discussion. And one point I want to make is that whoever, whichever parties host the discussion, it needs to be from a neutral standpoint. Um, you know, even though we've got people in our, our communities that are very community minded, a lot of those people are employed by an organization or a corporation that is paying them to have interest in whatever open source project that is. And they are going to come in with inherent biases that, that can't be avoided. So, you know, if the project is with the Linux Foundation, it's probably good to have a Linux Foundation staff member or, um, you know, some other, maybe somebody from a separate community to come in that doesn't have personal interest in, in that to, to sort of host that media discussion. And that's kind of also where it goes back to defining our roles and responsibilities. What does that look like? Um, and then, of course, we have our code of conduct for a reason. You want to talk a little bit about yeah, so the, if you have a code of conduct, there's uh, the contributor covenant. You can go online, you can pull, pull it down as a copy. You can, over 100,000 projects have adopted a version of that uh, as their, it kind of defines your community guidelines, like how to behave within the community. And it gives you a mechanism to push back on bad actors. So if you have somebody who is misbehaving in your community or who says something uh, that, it, or as I say, trolling within, within the community, you can say, oh, you're not following our community. This is our guideline. This is what, you know, so we, then we want to push you out. Uh, on a, like I had a personal experience on that when we were running a project. Uh, someone said, oh, you were being biased and they sent a profanity-laden email directed <laughs> at us as the community leaders. Who's us? The community, the community project leaders uh, were, were sent an email saying that we were being biased. But was then, it like sent to the board or the TSC or the uh, LF or the, the the facilitators, the staff? Yeah. Okay. The staff who were helping on that project at the time, and um, and then we we had we, we were looking at okay, how do we push back? And this was many years ago, just kind of before the community the covenant was kind of out, but you have we went back and they go, but we have guidelines for how you should behave on a mailing list. And then that's what we had reused as the guidelines and said, okay, this is in, inappropriate behavior. And therefore, you know, we're taking this action and, and end up blocking that person uh, from the community. Yeah, most, that's an extreme case. Most of the time, it's, you're not even going to have to pull up the code of conduct, but it is there for a reason. Um, 
But, you know, I mean, we've all, we're all in open source communities. We've all seen somebody maybe irate is a little bit of a strong word, but we've seen people kind of take over and derail discussions. And sometimes it can be really difficult to regain control and get everybody back on track. Um, yeah, and sometimes you've seen, you've probably seen, it could be an agenda, a personal agenda someone has, their, their, their company may be working uh, on, and on, a, on a competing technology, so they, just, they make noise in the community. And so this kind of gives you that. You have to assess it, and it's a case by case, yeah. but you got to look at it, uh, see what the circumstances are, and, and, get, and then look that way. So that's sort of, um, so with that, we can do that next one. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and I, I also want to touch on um, there's a fine line between making sure people are heard and having a discussion or multiple discussions get, get derailed. So I think that's important where it comes back into either a moderator or whoever's leading the discussion. Part of that role is to come in and say, oh, these are really good comments. Thank you for your feedback. We need to get back to the agenda, <clears throat> which I know we've all tried to do that. Sometimes it's harder than others. but. I think it's important to continue to reiterate that when things start to derail too much. Um, and sometimes it can be helpful to have other people on the call. You know, if the moderator or <clears throat> the discussion host is having a hard time regaining that control for others to kind of step in, but just make sure you do it without f people feeling bullied. Excuse me. Yeah. And have the opportunity for folks to, to have their <laughs> viewpoints heard. So if you are moderating or you're in, the, in that role, uh, you should kind of be open to, okay, saying, uh, if you have, you know, is there another perspective? Do you want to share your thoughts? <clears throat> kind of go around, maybe around the room. Don't, maybe not identify people individually because you put people on the spot. Uh, do it offline. If, uh, if you think a conversation is getting heated in, in the moment, take it back a bit and say, okay, let's, uh, let's take this offline. Let's discuss this over, uh, on, the, on the mailing list or on the chat channel. And then that way you can, you can get the dialogue going. <clears throat> Uh, and then encourage people to find that when we say middle road, it's like the what's the best path forward? So we want to move the project forward. Uh, how? What's so? You, so this may not be the ideal as, as the solution, but let's kind of take that and move 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 the. Uh, or and if it gets really stuck, what is a path forward? What will work? It's maybe not the best solution, but it's a workable solution that we just need to implement now to keep things moving. Right, yeah. And again, a lot of this is, is kind of reiterating what we've already been saying about compromising, but you know, not everybody's gonna get um, their way every time, and that's okay. And, and again, as I said, if, if folks are getting uh, stalled out in the details, in the moment, in the details, again, go back to your North Star and say, what are we trying to achieve as a community and as, an, as a group? Uh, and even in that could be not just as your community, but it could just be for that meeting, meaning, okay, this is our agenda, let's try to get back to topic and then uh, kind of re and then redirect the, the energy. Um, some, some other things to keep in mind are empathy. Um, I know some of, this, some of this sounds a little bit fluffy, but it can go a long way. Um, just sort of putting yourself in somebody else's shoes. You know, maybe somebody's having a bad day. They could be getting a lot of pressure from their boss, and that's unfortunately being taken out on the community. Um, just try to remember that, you know, those things happen to everybody, and it's, you know, try not to take things personally. Um, yeah, as, uh, if you're, especially if you're leading a community, I think... Uh, you, you tend to have to go in with a slightly thicker skin <laughs> so that you can manage that. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, some, sometimes these, these strong viewpoints can provide something that can be embraced by the community. Maybe somebody's, you know, really stuck on something. They're stuck on it for a reason, whether it's a personal agenda or not. Um, a lot of times it's really good input. Maybe it's not appropriate for whatever circumstance you're dealing with, but it could still be some good information to, you know, keep in the parking lot for another situation. Um, and then, of course, just make sure you stay open um, and then tailor your engagement strategies appropriately, knowing that, you know, people are, are coming from different places. Uh, and then I think uh, just finally, I would say just be open to new approaches and ideas. Don't be 
rigid in your approach. Uh, and as we said earlier, there are many roads to the, the end solution. So don't be fixed on an approach. Uh, I can, as an example here, we, you, you, know, you could have a project where someone says, the, this is my idea and I want to go, we, and then they've worked on it for a while, but then you get a new member that comes in and says, oh no, there's this new technology called K8s and we should containerize everything. Pros and cons to it, we, you know, ask them to look at the pros, the cons, and then see if the pros outweigh the cons. Uh, and then you might even be open to a new approach and you can solve the problem. In, in, this, in that particular example, um, the, the person who had the previous approach kind of went through the five stages of grief <laughs> to go through the process. But eventually we got there and we moved things along. So that takes us through our, our prepared slides. Um, I know we've got we've got some time left. We're happy to open it up for Q and A for discussion. Um, like I said, we're we're not certainly not the experts in this area, and I'm assuming that a lot of people in this audience probably have some good information to share. Yep. Yes. Thanks, Karla Niemi and Mr. Neiman. Just one uh, comment. I think it's great advice that you said that uh, get back to it later, like get back to it offline. But then great leadership is to actually do it, because I think that's kind of a general joke that when you say to someone that let's take this offline, it means I never want to talk <laughs> about this ever again. So I think, yeah, then it's great to actually reach out to that person and continue the discussion one on one that can save others and make the other person really heard. Thanks. Yeah, definitely. You you don't want them to feel like you're just trying to make them be quiet. Yeah, you want to be proactive on that uh, on that follow up. Yep. Do we have any other questions? Any other entertaining stories? Yeah, community stories always welcome. So, uh, but, uh, leave the community name out, but tell us the story. <laughs> Hi, um, thanks, very interesting. Um, how do you think about governance models? Because I dived a bit more into it and I think that could help too if you write down your governance model, so the rules you have, the roles you have, and that it's also written down how that whole process is done so you can reflect back to it. How, how do, what's your experience with writing such things down? Yeah, I think that that touches on the, the, the what we mentioned the roles and responsibilities. Um, so we, we didn't we left out sort of the at a high level when you go into a project you have the governance charters the the process there. You could go into a technical model of defining the charter as well. But if you just look at a project, uh, take any project uh, LF hosted mainly they they use a template. But then you can fill those in the governance level, and then you can understand what your roles and responsibilities are. Uh, and then it tells you sort of which swim lane that they're in. So when you talk about the governance, you're thinking of like the board level. Uh, there's a board, there's a technical steering committee, and then maybe the board has uh, uh, executive committees or uh, subcommittees that maybe do marketing and they're responsible for outreach and stuff. Yeah, but I don't, I don't know that behavior and consensus driving is, is always built into that. So that could be something to keep in mind moving forward that maybe we need a little bit more structure around some of the decision making. Yeah, I think the the ones that you th may be thinking of have like a voting. That's about may maybe the only one that I've seen yeah. called out is a voting approach. I, I agree that I think that would help. <laughs> yeah. Good. Do we have any other questions? Comments? I had maybe a question about um, setting an agenda for a community meeting or whatever. Is it common practice to have dedicated time to a fixed agenda and then some amount of time to an open agenda? Uh, preferably because that gives people a voice or a place to voice their opinions without derailing set agenda. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I think yeah, the short answer is yes. And then the way you might arrange that is like, say, at the first uh, five minutes of your call, uh, are there any open topics that anyone wants to bring uh, to the t discussion? Um, even that even applies for your, if you're running your own technical meeting within your, say, within your company. I do that. Uh, I have a weekly technical stand-up uh, for one of the programs I run uh, where I spent the first, like, two, three minutes is, hey, anyone have top of mind topics you want to bring up? And that opens the forum up and then uh, I'm prepared after that to go 
so and so, you know, what's your update on X, Y, Z? And then that helps drive the meeting. Yeah, and another good approach to that is to have part of your meeting dedicated to following up on action items from the previous meeting. Like if you said, I'm going to follow, we'll follow that up offline. This holds people accountable for actually doing that if it comes up again in the next meeting. Great. All right. Yeah. yeah if, got, I think we have time. Yeah, we've, we've got a few more minutes, but I think um, you all can just start your lunch early then if there's nothing else. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for your time. Thank you.